Okay, thanks everyone for coming and thanks to the NRF for organising this great event. Um, so yes, I will be talking about the work that our group has been doing on developing a really new type of therapy for um, glioblastoma, which is CAR T cell therapy. Um, so some of you may have heard about CAR T cell therapy in the media recently. It's been getting a lot of attention um, because it is a really new approach to cancer treatment um, and it's having some really spectacular uh, results in, in other types of cancer. So um, for those who are not familiar with this approach, it's based on using uh, a type of cell that's in our own bodies called T-cells, which are a component of your immune system, which normally circulate in the blood and their primary function really is to guard against infection. However, using CAR T-cell technology, they can actually be redirected to seek out and destroy cancer cells in a very specific way. So briefly, this is how it happens. Um, it's a, it's a personalised therapy, so it's made just for, for an individual patient. Um, at the moment, although people are looking at ways to generate a sort of off-the-shelf product down the track. But currently, this is what happens. Um, a patient's white blood cells are collected, um, through putting a, a needle in the vein. Um, they're then taken to the lab where the T cells are isolated and activated. Um, the T cells are then genetically engineered um, to get a new gene which encodes this CAR molecule. So CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. It's basically just a, uh, a new protein that's gonna sit on the surface of the T cell and it tells that T cell how to recognize a cancer cell. Uh, the T cells are then grown and expanded up in number and then they're put back into the same patient. So um, this really has been a breakthrough in the treatment of some types of leukaemia. Um, and in fact, we're seeing many patients who previously would have only had weeks or months to live. This was really a last resort therapy. Um, they're now living cancer free. Um, so this is one of the very first patients ever treated with this therapy. Um, it's currently seven years cancer free. So what we want to know is whether we can replicate the approach um, and the success of this approach in other cancers and one of our focuses in our group is trying to get it to work for glioblastoma. Okay, so um, one of the challenges though in adapting this approach to other cancers is that the CAR-T therapy is very specific. So this is one of the benefits, um, but also part of its difficulty. So the potent cell killing activity of the T cells is controlled by a lock and key type mechanism. So we can think of, so I'll just go back. So this picture here uh, is an electromicrograph of a, a cancer cell. And you can see here the T cells swarming over this cancer cell, um, trying to attack it. But they'll only do this if their activity has been unlocked. Um, so you can think of the T cells in the bloodstream as being locked up. They can't really do anything until they encounter a key that unlocks that activity. And the key is a, is a protein that's on the surface of the cancer cell, and it's different for every cancer. So the molecule that's targeted by CAR T cells in B cell leukemias, where this approach has been successful, is a molecule called CD19. But CD19 is not on glioblastoma cells. So what we need to do is find a suitable target molecule for this approach in glioblastoma. And that's been the focus of my research um, for the last few years. And we now think we have found a very good target. In fact, we think we've found a few very good targets. Um, so I'll tell you about one of them today and my colleague Tessa will tell you about another of them a bit later on. So the one I'll tell you about today is known as FAP, um, stands for fibroblast activation protein. It's a molecule that's involved in wound healing, but is not normally present in any healthy tissues. And what we have um, shown recently is that it is present in glioblastoma. So you can see here, this is a piece of um, patient brain tumor tissue. It's been sliced very thin and then stained uh, with an antibody so that we can see where the fat protein is present. And then we look at this under the microscope. So basically wherever you see brown on here, I hope it's coming up on the screen, is where the fat is. And we know from the structure of this tissue that this area over here is glioblastoma and sitting next to it is a section of healthy brain tissue. And we're really interested to see that all of the brown is restricted to the tumour tissue um, with none in the healthy brain. Uh, 
Uh, so just um, zooming in a bit more on this, this is a different example. So this is looking at a section, again, of blue blastoma tissue. We can see all of these cancer cells here are expressing fat. But interestingly, we also found fat in these structures here, which we know are tumour blood vessels. So it's, this protein is not just present in the cancer cells themselves, but also in the blood vessels that are feeding the cancer and helping it to grow. So what we hope is if we can make CAR T cells that recognise fat, we should be able to target the, the cancer cells themselves and then also the tumours, uh, sorry, the blood vessels that are feeding the cancer. And interestingly, we've also found this example of, um, this is what uh, Melinda and Brani were talking about, often these tumours um, are very invasive, so little bits of the tumour will break off and start invading into the healthy brain tissue. We can see that happening here. And interestingly, a lot of these little clumps of invading tumour cells also express fat. So we're hoping that our therapy will be able to actually hunt down and, and kill these invading tumour cells. Okay, so we think that fat really will be a, a very good CAR T cell um, target for glioblastoma. We've now screened um, over 30 glioblastoma patient samples and found that most of them have some fat, so sitting up here, whereas all of the normal brain tissue we've looked at lacks fat. And we've also shown that fat is present in blood vessels of every single glioblastoma tumour we've looked at. So we can see here, again, microscopy images where we have labelled the blood vessels with a protein called CD31. It's coming up in green. And this is the same tissue stained for fat in purple. You can see they really overlap. So it means that pretty much every blood vessel um, in this tumour is expressing fat. And this is expressed graphically here for all of these different patient samples we've looked at. And then the last um, piece of the puzzle here is can we actually get this to work? So we have engineered CAR T cells targeting fat. We've done a lot of work in the laboratory to show that they can kill uh, glioblastoma cells, including ones taken straight from a patient. Um, and then we've started now testing this therapy in, in mouse models. So this is um, initial data from a, a very simple mouse model uh, where we've just put some glioblastoma cells um, under the skin on the, on the flank of a mouse just to create a little tumour lump that's very easy to, to measure. And what we see here, if we're looking at the size of these tumours um, measured with calipers, we can see that the untreated mice or the mice treated with control T cells, the tumours continue to grow, whereas if mice are treated with our fat CAR T cells, um, the growth is, is much slower. So we think that CAR T cell therapy could be a revolutionary new treatment for glioblastoma but we really need to find the right molecule or molecules to target. Uh, we think that FAP is an excellent option. Um, so far it's been present in all of the glioblastoma tumours that we've examined. Um, in most of the tumours it's expressed by the cancer cells and in all of them it's, ex it's expressed by the uh, tumour blood vessels. Importantly, it's not present in healthy brain um, and I didn't show this data, it's also not present in any other healthy tissues. So that means it should be a really focused, targeted therapy. And we have data so far suggesting that the fat targeting CAR T cells can actually control tumour growth to some extent in a simple mouse model. Um, we now have a lot more work to do. So we would like to now test our fat targeting CAR T cells in the advanced uh, brain tumour models that uh, Melinda introduced you to. It should be a lot more representative of how it's going to work in patients um, and we want to optimise the therapy so we don't want to see the tumour growth just you know, slowing down or stabilising, we actually want to see these tumours eliminated. So ways to do this, uh, firstly to increase the dose of CAR T cells, initially we were just testing a very low dose, but we're also looking at targeting multiple molecules at the same time, so not just fat but combining this with, with other molecules that we've identified. And hopefully um, progressing this to clinical trials. So there's a lot more work to do in terms of optimization and safety studies. Um, but we are already conducting CAR T cell clinical trials here at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and Tessa will tell you more about that. Uh, so this new approach could potentially be rolled in with that. So I'd just like to thank everyone involved in this work, um, including Professor Michael Brown, who's 
not only the director of our research group, but also the Cancer Clinical Trials Unit at the Royal Adelaide. Um, everyone in our lab, um, our collaborators, and in particular the South Australian Neurological Tumor Bank who provide us with a lot of the tissue for these studies. And a big shout out to NRF who've uh, given us two project grants so far to fund this research, um, which we have actually leveraged now to get two new grants that are going to fund it moving forward over the next um, three years. Thank you. cells out of patients, manipulate them, put them back into the patient, that can be, uh, on a larger scale, can be quite a difficult process and an expensive process. So where are we in Australia at that sort of stage of being able to do that on a, on a more routine basis? It's really just starting up. So, um, I mean, the first large scale application we see will be in the, the B cell leukemias. Um, and currently in, in Adelaide, it's, it's not even available. Um, you have to travel to Melbourne to get this done specialised therapy. So really we need um, a lot of investment to bring this very specialised um, new therapeutic technology um, to South Australia. It's um, just not here yet, unfortunately. I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's incredibly important and I'm, I'm a very I'm a big advocate for, for, for that. And I think we need to then try and you know, get those the, the data to show that it's working really well. And then I think really pushing, pushing this type of therapy because it's completely different to what, what really has been happening up to this point for, for the last you know, you know, 30 or 40 years of treating with chemotherapy or other drugs, yeah. being able to actually you know, harness the immune system to really target and kill these tumours is incredibly exciting. I think yeah, we need to have some good data to be able to really push the government to start investing heavily in this area. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Do you envision just giving the drug without a tissue diagnosis? No, we, uh, well, we would definitely need a, a diagnosis of, of glioblastoma, and then from the tissue that was used to conduct the diagnosis, we would almost certainly check for expression of that. Um, I mean, if we're finding consistently that every tumour had lots, maybe it's, it's not necessary, um, but normally that's what would be done. Can it be in the system in lesser brain tumours, so lesser glioma? It when I say less, I mean less malignant. Yes. Yeah. Potentially, it could. I mean, this approach could be used for targeting any cancer type if you could find the right molecule to target. Um, however, the downside is it can be associated with toxicities. So you'd have to weigh up the chance of those toxicities against the, um, the potential benefits and also the cost. I mean, this is from a cheap therapy. Um, so you have to look at whether governments are willing to fund the therapy. Yeah. So at the moment, it's really only On that, so that obviously many of the current therapies that are you know, like temozolomide and, and either chemotherapies used for other cancers tend to hit the immune system quite hard. What's the evidence of, that, of how that affects the T cells? Because you're, you're then looking at a, a, an end stage patient where you want to get the T cells out of those patients to manipulate them to put them back in again. What are those earlier therapies doing to the T cells, and, and you know, is there a is there a much better chance of that working up front before they receive any other therapy? Yeah, it's an interesting question. We actually um, had a master's student looking at that. She was looking at, I guess, the fitness of T cells from patients who'd already been treated for their cancer, whether they would go on to be able to make a good CAR T cell product. Um, and overall, she actually showed in her own research and also from other published literature that it's possible they might even be better. Um, so the chemotherapy can shape the immune system in certain ways, and some of those changes are actually positive. The problem with GBM, though, is often the patients treated with steroids, and actually they, that is going to be more of a problem, I think, for the chemotherapy. So we would certainly want to have a, a washout of any steroids before the end of the therapy. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa, and the other speakers in this, uh, these two sessions. So just